Hi everyone, my name's Eleanor and I'm here today to tell you how I use statistics in my work to protect us against extreme sea levels resulting from climate change. Before I get into that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm a PhD student at Lancaster University and a PhD, which stands for a Doctorate of Philosophy, is an academic qualification that you do after your standard degree. It takes between three and four years and instead of sitting exams and doing coursework like you'll be familiar with, you have to make an original contribution to knowledge. So in order to get the degree, you have to come up with some new ideas, test them, get some results and then write it all up into this big book that we call a thesis. And then right at the end, you have to defend it. So some experts in the field with more experience will come along, read the thesis and ask you lots and lots and lots of questions and make sure you can defend the work you've done. And you might be thinking, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, first and foremost, it's a job. You get paid. It's also great for personal development. You can publish your research into journals so that people can read it and present at conferences all across the world. And you get a doctorate. So you can use the title doctor like Ross in Friends. You're not a medical doctor, but you're a doctor of maths or stats, which I still think is quite cool. So how did I get to where I am now? Well, not that long ago, or at least it doesn't feel that long ago, I was exactly where you are. I'd finished my GCSEs and was doing my A-levels and thinking about what to do next. I'd always really enjoyed maths. I liked the idea of long questions and you break them down into a step by step process and then get a definite answer. And by no means was I naturally gifted at it. I was not in my top set GCSE class and one of my teachers actually told me I wasn't good enough to pursue a career in maths. But I really enjoyed it so I just persevered and worked hard and here I am. So after school I joined Lancaster University to do a maths degree in 2016. I always knew I wanted to go to uni because I loved school and I felt like I wanted to keep learning and to be honest I wasn't really ready to get a job. I feel like at that time there wasn't as much focus on other opportunities like apprenticeships as I, I think there is now. During my degree I started to first learn about statistics and again I kind of wanted to know more so at the end of my degree I thought go on I'll do another one so I did my master's in statistics. This is a one year course and this particular course was an MRes so it was a master of statistics uh, a master's of research sorry and had a big focus on research which I absolutely fell in love with. I love the idea of trying to come up with new maths and try new things, not knowing if they would work or not. So I decided to do a PhD that felt like the natural next step. But it was important to me that the research that I would be doing in my PhD would be helpful to people and actually be used, which is why I specialised in environmental statistics. As we all know, the environment is a super hot topic at the minute with the growing concerns surrounding climate change. And if I can even make the smallest contribution to helping with our fight against climate change, then that's amazing. That's enough motivation for me. So what is statistics? Well, it's a part of maths that is concerned with all things data, it's studying and manipulating data. This involves data collection, description, analysis and drawing conclusions, which we call inference, so that it can all be understood by the general public. And statistics are present everywhere in our lives and it's applicable in so many different areas, such as sports, neuroscience, medicine, uh, pandemic analysis. We saw so many statistics flying around during the coronavirus outbreak not that long ago, but so many other areas as well that you wouldn't even think of. And you might have done some statistics already, if not, no worries, but you might have heard of the mean, median and mode. And this tells us about the average of the data, the middle value or the most common value. And these are used quite a bit, but actually they don't tell us too much about the data. They don't tell us how it changes with time or relationships between variables. And we can't use these values to make any predictions about the future. So instead, what we do is build a statistical model for the data, and this helps us make more meaningful conclusions. And there's a variety of ways to model data, some of which you might have heard of, and I'm going to cover some of them today. So before we get started, let's look at some data. This graph shows sea level observations over 50 years at Hesham, which is on the northwest coastline of England, not too far away from me in Lancaster. So we've got the time on the X axis and in terms of date and the sea level in metres on the Y axis. And you can see there's a lot of data points. We have about 35,000 observations here in total, which is great. The more data, the better, because you can really get an idea of what's going on. 
You can see we've got some gaps in the data, sort of in the 1970s. This is where the measuring device was faulty. And in reality, data is never perfect. You do have things like missingness, but for us, it's not too much to worry about because we still have a lot of data. So if we look at the mean, median and mode, you can see these don't really tell us much about the bigger picture. We have all of this data, but we're just boiling it down to just one number, and that's not very informative. So instead, let's have a look at how the data changes with time. And to simplify this, I've shown the annual mean sea level. So this is just the mean in each year. Each point represents a mean. And immediately you can see that this is generally increasing trend across time, which is what we would expect with everything we hear in the news with climate change. So global warming, ice caps melting, sea levels rising. And we can model this trend using what we call a linear model. And this is just essentially drawing a straight line, a line of best thread through the data, which you might have done in science experiments and things. This line will have an equation that you might be familiar with, y equals mx plus c. So our trend is characterized by the gradient of the line m. So how steep is the line? How strong is that relationship between the, the year and the annual mean? And where the line intercepts the x-axis, uh, the y-axis, sorry, c then we can use this model to infer about the future. Say we want to know what the mean sea level will be in 2030. Let's just extend our straight line, find 2030 on the x-axis, and then find the equivalent sea level. And our model tells us this will be about 8.82 metres. So you can see this is a really good statistical tool that's quite quick, quick to implement. It's widely used and can tell us about the future. But do you actually think it's capturing what's going on in our data? Well, probably not. You can see there's a few values that lie really far away from our line of best fit. So maybe we can improve the model. Another type of model is what's called a probabilistic model. This tells us about the likelihood or the probability that we will observe each value in our data. And we can show this using what's called a histogram. So this is the graph on the screen. On the x-axis, again, we've got our sea level observations in metres, and the height of each bar tells us about the likelihood of observing a sea level in that width. So you can see we're most likely to observe a sea level at Hesham between 8.5 and 9 metres, but least likely to observe values bigger than 11 metres or smaller than 6.5. And similar to the linear model, let's just draw a line of what this probabilistic trend would look like. And this is our model. This is called the normal model. Similar to the linear model being characterized by the gradient and the intercept, the normal model is described by its mean of the data and the variance to give us this bell-shaped curve. So the mean we've already talked about, that's the average and that's the peak of this curve, whereas the variance tells us about the variability of the data, how spread is it? And that tells us about sort of the width um, of the curve and it gives us this bell shape. So let's look at the mean. If we change our mean, we can just shift our curve up and down the x-axis. So the blue curve, we've taken a higher mean of 11 and shift the entire curve up. Whereas if we decrease it, it moves the whole curve lower down the x-axis. What about the variance? So if we take a variance of one as our standard, then if we decrease this, say to, two and, uh, to 0.25, which is a blue curve, you can see the data is less variable. We've got a higher concentration of seeing values around the mean. It's much steeper. That's because there's less spread. If we look at a variance that's bigger, say of four, we've got a bigger spread of data. So it's not all concentrated around the mean and the curve is fatter and flatter. So if we go back to our data, which sea levels do you think pose the greatest risk to us? It's not going to be the ones that we see most frequently in the middle of the data, what we call the body. It's going to be the largest values. This is what we call the extremes and they pose the greatest threat to us. And this is the case for so many environmental variables. Take rainfall. We're only interested in the really, really large, rare rainfall events that cause flooding. Or take temperatures. We're familiar with the average daily temperatures that we see all the time, but it's the super, super high temperatures that cause droughts and introduce things like hosepipe bands that we're not used to seeing. Or even the extremely cold temperatures, look at the other end of the data. They're also a threat to us as well. So today we're focusing on sea levels and, protect us, and to protect us against them, we can build coastal defences such as a seawall, which looks something like this. So let's say we're going to build a seawall to protect the coastline at Hesham. How tall should we build it? We don't ever want it to be exceeded in the future. So we want to build it tall enough to protect the coastline. But also we don't have an infinite amount of resources and money and time. So we don't just want to build it really high and waste resources. Well, let's look at our data. 
Now we're concerned with the extremes, I've focused on the annual maximum. So again, we've got year on the x-axis and sea level on the y, and instead of showing the mean in each year, which sits in the main body of our data, I'm showing the maximum in each year. And we could build our seawall to the largest value we have in our data, but we don't know if that will be exceeded in the next 10, 20, 30 years. We could pick something bigger than the maximum, but how much bigger? Because we don't just want to waste money and resources building a seawall that's going to be way too high. Instead, we can use statistics to estimate what we call a return level. This is the level we expect to be exceeded once every some number of years, and we call that number of years the return period. So for example, we can estimate a 10 year return level, the value we expect to be exceeded once every 10 years, because we have 50 years of data, we can pick a level that's exceeded five times in 50 years. Five over 50 is equal to one over 10. And this is shown by the red line, it's about 11.05 metres, and you can see in our 50 year period it exceeded five times by those five red points. We can even find a value exceeded once every 50 years, what we would call the 50 year return level, just find the value that's exceeded once in our 50 year period. But what if our seawall is expected to stand for 100 years? We would want the 100 year return level, but we don't have 100 years of data. So how would we find this? Well, we could guess, I've put it here at 11.8 in the red line. That feels quite reasonable, but how do we know? We could wait another 50 years, but that's not very efficient. We could have coastal flooding at that point. Perhaps our statistical model from earlier can help. So let's get our normal model back up. This tells us that the probability of seeing that sea level of 11.8 metres that I put as a guess is zero. Well, that's not very useful. Actually, our model here is restricted to the range of observed data. So for any sea level higher than the maximum in our data, it has a zero chance of occurring. And that's because in our model, we modelled all of the data and so much of that data is determined by the main body. And actually, we're not interested in that. We're only interested in the extremes. So instead, we want a model for the extreme values that can tell us about events that haven't even happened yet. And just like the normal model can be useful for capturing the main body of the data, there's a similar model that can be used for the extreme values of the data. And just like the normal model being characterised by the mean and the variance, this model is characterised by three parameters. So firstly, we have the scale parameter that tells us about the scale of extreme values. So how big are they going to be? What's the magnitude of those events? The rate parameter tells us about the frequency of observing extreme events. So how often are we going to see these extremes? How many a year will we see, for example? And the shape parameter we won't worry about today, but it does tell us about the shape of our, of our model. So to get our model today, we just need to find out what these two parameters should be, the scale and the rate. But we also want to make sure that our model reflects the realism of the sea level processes. And this is a really interesting and important part of statistics. And one of the parts of being a statistician that I love is that we get to collaborate with experts in the field of interest. So experts that really understand this data. And for me, that's learning from oceanographers about what causes sea levels. But it can be a range of people depending on your application. It could be meteorologists, hydrologists, climatologists, seismologists. And what did I learn from speaking to oceanographers? Well, the sea levels can actually be split into two components. First, we have the tides. This is the predictable rise and fall of the sea surface, which is driven by the gravitational interaction between the Earth and the moon. As the moon orbits us, its position relative to the sun determines what the tide should be. Now, this is a process that I don't fully understand, but that's OK because there's oceanographers and astronomers who do. What's important to me as the statistician is the part about the tides being predictable because the oceanographers know so much about the tides, they're able to predict them really far in advance, thousands of years into the future with a high degree of accuracy. So statistics isn't required here because they can tell me exactly what the tide is gonna be a hundred years, a thousand years from now. Where statistics is needed is for the surge. Surges are the shorter term sea level changes caused by the weather. So when we have high rainfall, high winds, the sea levels will, will likely be higher than in calmer weather conditions. We can forecast the surges in a similar way that we can forecast the weather, which, as you know, isn't always very accurate and we can't predict the weather very far in advance. So the same applies to surges, and this is where statistical modelling comes in. 
Instead of modelling the extreme sea levels, we only need to model the extreme surges, which simplifies our problem a little bit. The first thing we need to do is define which values are extreme values. To do this, we choose a threshold so that any value exceeding that threshold is considered as an extreme value. Here, we pick a threshold so that only the top 5% of surges lie above this. And now we need to decide how to model these extreme values in terms of their magnitude and their frequency. Well, we can just look at our histogram and say the magnitude of extreme surges is somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5 metres. And well, we've said that the top 5% of surges are our extremes, so the frequency is going to be 5% of the time. And that's fine, but recall that we said we wanted to reflect the realism of the sea level processes, and this can make our model better. We can do this by looking at how magnitude and frequency vary with time. So recall that surges are driven by weather conditions and are likely to be influenced by climate change as we experience more freak weather events, such as the big rainfall events we've been seeing in recent years. Let's check if we can see any longer term trends in the extreme surges by looking at them across year. Let's start with the magnitude of extreme surges over time. We can use the linear model that we talked about earlier, and you can immediately see that our line is pretty flat. This suggests that the size of extreme surges isn't really changing across time in the long term. But if we look at the frequency, so this graph shows the number of extreme events in each year, you can see there's clearly an increase in the count. This is something we would want to account for in our model, and it's a really exciting conclusion. So we're finding that because of climate change, because of these longer term effects, the magnitude of these extreme surges isn't really changing, but they are becoming more frequent. So we know that the extreme surges are affected by these longer term weather conditions. What about short term weather conditions? Let's look at the magnitude of surges within a year. So this graph shows the surges on each day of the year on the X axis. We can immediately see that these are higher in the winter and lower in the summer. And that's exactly what we would expect since they're driven by weather conditions. It's rainier and windier in the winter, so the surges are really, really high, but in the summer they're much smaller. And how are we going to model this? We can't use a linear model because the trend clearly doesn't follow a straight line. We probably want something that looks like this. So the magnitude decreases from winter to summer and then increases again as we go back into the winter. But this doesn't look very nice. Is there a better way that we could model this so it's smooth across the year? Can you think of anything that has this sort of shape? Well, what we actually use is a trigonometric function. So we take our standard sine wave that you'll be familiar with and play around with it so it takes the surge values that we want. At the moment, it takes values between minus one and one, which is standard. So the width here is about two meters. And we know that extreme sea surges, extreme surges, sorry, take values between 0.5 and 1.5 meters. So this has a width of one meter. Well, we can just multiply our sine wave by a half to change the width from two meters to one meters. But these aren't the values we want. We want them to be between 0.5 and 1.5. So we just shift it up the y-axis by one meter so it takes the correct values. But now it's not taking the right values at the right time of year. This shows that the highest surges will occur in spring and the lowest in autumn. We want the highest in winter and the lowest in summer. So we can just shift it along the x-axis by 90 days and this gives us a red curve, which is exactly what we want. Let's look at this in comparison to our data. You can see this, that this is capturing exactly what's going on using the sine wave. We've got the higher values in the winter and lower in the summer, and it's a nice smooth trend. So finally, let's look at how we're counting for this within year seasonality and the longer, longer term climate change effects changes our results. We're concerned with estimating the 100 year sea levels so that we can build our sea wall. Recall this is the value exceeded once every 100 years, so it's not been observed yet within our data. This graph shows sea level return levels for different return periods on the x-axis in terms of year and the corresponding sea level on the y-axis. And we do this before we account for seasonality and climate change in the black curve and then afterwards in the blue curve. And you can see the blue line is consistently higher than the black one. But how do we know which one's correct? Well, we can compare it with estimates that we get from the data directly without any statistical modelling. We have 50 years of data, so we can find the value exceeded once in that time interval, as we did right at the beginning of this talk. And this will tell us the 50 year return period. 
we can do that for any return period less than 50 years because we have that much data. And that's what the red points are. You can immediately see that the blue curve lies much closer to those red points, so it's, ca it's capturing what's going on in the data much better. So actually, ignoring seasonality and ignoring climate change means that if we took this 100-year return level to build our seawall, it would be 0.03 metres, which is three centimetres too low. And three centimetres doesn't sound like a lot, but it's critical that the seawall isn't built too low or it will just be inundated by the sea and the coastal town would be flooded. Now, what's really cool about our model is that we don't have to stop at the 100 year return level. We can take this even further and look at the level exceeded every 500, 1000, 10,000 years or even beyond that. So here I've extended the curve for both models with and without the seasonality and climate change to estimate up to the 10,000 year return level. And our model suggests a sea level of 12.5 metres will be exceeded in the next 10,000 years. And again, you can see this is much higher than ignoring seasonality and climate change. So it's critical that we do capture the realism of the sea level processes. And you might be thinking, well, why would we want to know the 10,000 year return level? Well, I work with EDF, who are the biggest energy provider in the UK, and they own all of the nuclear power stations in the UK. These are all situated on the coastline. So Hesham is a site we've been looking at throughout this talk and is on the northwest coast, like I said, near me in Lancaster. And it has two power stations. As you can imagine, the consequences of coastal flooding at these locations are even more drastic given the nature of nuclear power and radioactivity. So instead of building a seawall to the height of its lifespan, about 100 years, they built them to the 10,000 year level. Not because they expect them to stand for 10,000 years, but because we want to be super confident that these will not be exceeded by the sea. We want, still want some sound methodology to estimate this value rather than guessing it. So they go with the 10,000 year level. Not only is my method being implemented at EDF for nuclear power safety, it's also going to be used by the UK government to upgrade coastal defences around the entire UK's coastline to protect us against the risks of climate change which is super cool. Less than 10 years ago, I was sat exactly where you are, thinking I wasn't good enough to pursue a career in maths. And now here I am, using my knowledge and expertise in statistics to help in our fight against climate change. And this is only one small area where statistics is used to fight climate, to fight climate change. There's so much interesting research going on all around the world. So if you're interested, definitely take a look. Before I finish, I want to say a huge thank you for listening to me today. I wish you the absolute best of luck with the rest of your studies and whatever you decide to do next. Thanks again. Bye.